This special election episode of New Politics was released on the 28th of May, 2022, and produced on the land of the Wangal people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, we analyse the results of the 2022 federal election, a fundamental realignment of Australia's political system, and we look at what the future might hold for all sides of politics. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis. Mathematically possible, but very, very difficult. A big thank you to our new Patreon subscribers. Thanks for signing up. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription. It's just $5 per month for the Ruby Standard Supporter level or $10 per month for the Gold Standard Supporter level. But whether it's a subscription or if you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a t-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. The 2022 federal election has resulted in a narrow victory for the Labor Party, or at worst, a hung parliament. But this result is deceptive. The Liberal Party has lost seats in its heartland areas in Sydney and Melbourne to the Teal Independents, and the Liberal National Coalition has won 57 seats, or a loss of 19 seats. Anthony Albanese has been sworn in as the Prime Minister, and he's the 13th Labor Prime Minister and 31st overall. And it was a strange pathway to victory. Earlier on in the evening, it looked like we might be in for a repeat of Scott Morrison's surprise victory from 2019. But as the night went on, it was apparent that the coalition was in for an electoral thrashing and Labor was going to be the only party that could form government. The Australian Greens picked up a few additional seats. The crossbench has increased from 7 to 15. And while it might not be a crushing victory for the Labor Party, this is probably as bad as it can get for the coalition. A loss of 19 seats a huge buffer created by the crossbench, primarily by the Teal Independents, and it might take a while for them to get back into government again. Anything's possible, of course, but this type of loss, and we have a couple of uh, historical precedents, this type of loss tends to mean that you're not getting back in anytime soon. Paul Keating said something along the lines of, they always give you a second go, meaning that if you win an election, you tend to win the next one. And then it's decided. Scott Morrison has made history by being the first Liberal Prime Minister to win an election and then get voted out on the next one. Some people said Billy McMahon, but he didn't actually face election when he won. He he lost his first election. And Tony Abbott didn't face a second election is the other thing some people kind of point to. Uh, So Scott Morrison has lost in an unprecedented manner. It's a very interesting result. Primary voting is down across the major parties, firstly with the exception of the Greens, who we can consider a minor party in a parliamentary sense. They're a major party who have been part of the discussion for a long time, but in terms of the seats they win federally, they're a minor party. Although you're looking at the Senate, maybe that distinction might be eroding too. But apart from the Greens... No other minor party got through except for maybe Pauline Hanson in Queensland in the Senate. And even that at the time of recording is still in doubt. But all the minor parties, and we interviewed a few of them, and I enjoyed all of those interviews and thought that they presented really well. Nobody else got through. But a lot of genuine or non-party aligned independents did. 15. Actually, that 15 does include the Qatar Party. And the Qatar Party is essentially independent. Bob Catter wasn't going anywhere. He's one of the more popular independent members in the country, uh, in, in his local seat anyway. Zali Stegel in Warringah wasn't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Helen Haynes in Indi isn't going anywhere. Andrew Wilkie wasn't going anywhere. And I think we can say now that based on the figures, unless the Liberal Party learned some very hard, quick lessons and adapt very quickly in the three years, I'm not sure that Kylie Tink's going anywhere. I'm not sure that Allegra Spender's going anywhere. And I'm pretty sure Monique Ryan will be in, in these seats for a while, which is unusual. Independents only tend to last 
one term maybe. And there's a whole range of reasons for that. Looking at the figures, not only have they won the seats, they've cemented a future in those seats for the next few terms. And that's not a bad thing. And David, you've talked about the possibility of a realignment of politics for some time, and I think it's literally just happened. Overall, it was an excellent win for progressive politics, a narrow victory for the Labor Party, a collection of independents who want to make positive changes in politics, including cleaning up politics and anti-corruption commission. They want to see action on climate change. They want to see more work on women's safety. So it's not a massive victory for Labor, and the crossbench is large enough to keep the government on their toes. And it's been the end of nine years of aimless conservative of government, which ultimately wasn't very good for very much at all. There were those many issues that affected the vote on Saturday night, climate change, anti-corruption, renewables, costs of living pressures, the poor state of the economy. But it seems that the biggest issue at the ballot box was Scott Morrison. He was absolute poison for many people at the ballot box. And it wasn't so much of an endorsement of Labor, but a repudiation of Scott Morrison and the values of the Liberal Party. It's the end of the Howard neoliberalism, I think which included a lot of those right-wing figures. We weren't expecting UAP to do very well at all, and it reached our expectations. I did think Queensland would be more of a loose cannon than it was in terms of its Senate seats. It must be pointed out that Liberals didn't lose very much in Queensland, and Labor lost to the Greens, and yeah, the Greens did extraordinarily well. Uh, even if you don't like the Greens, you cannot take away from their um, incredible, really, gains. It looks like they might get four seats. There's still one in doubt, but if they don't get it, they got so close as to be congratulated for how well they did. Tasmania swung towards the Liberal Party, oddly. It may be that the pork barrelling announcements, the the giving of $50 million, was it, to the uh, distillery, things like that may have worked in a state that isn't in economically good shape at the moment and was hit very, very hard by uh, coronavirus. It may be that it was just a typically conservative electorate who voted for what they thought was best and had a range of good local members. But apart from that, it was a pounding in Victoria, which particularly in retrospect, was obvious. It was a pounding in Western Australia, which was always going to be. And New South Wales was not quite a pounding as such, but it it was a pretty severe loss. And last week, we did predict a narrow Labor victory. And David, you and I are very professional. We don't tend to gloat about these things when we get that right. But as predicted, the polling did narrow. On election day, the vote in the two-party preferred voting was 52.2 for Labor and 47.8 for the coalition. And if I was the coalition, I'd actually be heartened by that. I thought the figure would actually be far, far worse than that. In Liberal heartland seats in Sydney and Melbourne, the swings were massive, as you mentioned before. Kuyong had a 10% swing. McKellar had a 15% swing, and that's a reflection of those swings that occurred in the recent New South Wales state by-elections. North Sydney had a 12% swing. Wentworth had a 5% swing, and this is all against the Liberal Party. And and all of these seats fell to independents. And it wasn't just the independents. Benelong also had an 8% swing to the Labor Party, and the Labor Party picked up that seat. You referred to this before. There were also massive swings towards the Labor Party in Perth, swings of between 9 and 11%. And they picked up four seats in Western Australia and gained a majority in that state for the first time since 1990. And it wasn't all plain sailing for Labor. And in Queensland, that's still a bit of a basket case for Labor, only holding five seats out of 30 in that state. The surprise in Queensland was the Australian Greens picking up those two seats and possibly three in the Brisbane area. So it seems like Queensland is still a problem for the Labor Party. It's likely to continue if Peter Dutton does become the leader of the opposition. But the Greens are starting to gain ground in that state. We've got to say, too, the territories. Canberra, for the first time ever, looks like it's knocked uh, the Liberal Party out of the Senate. The ACT generally has one Liberal and one Labor candidate as their representatives, which is a nice reflection of what the ACT should be, balanced and fair and unbiased, etc. The Liberal Party was so on the nose that they got rid of the Liberal Party, and it may not be back there for a long time. The other territory 
that I have seen the figures for is, of course, the Northern Territory, which is, looks like it's gone fairly solidly Labor. Uh, Lingiari, which was seen as a possible bellwether seat, has gone Labor, although it was close too. And you're right, it went down solely to the personality of Scott Morrison. I said last week, I think, that he was a high-stakes player and that he played risky, risky games. And I also felt that he didn't quite understand just how deeply unpopular he was. And to be fair, if you're being surrounded by people who are shaking your hand and saying, we want you to be prime minister, and that's where he ended up spending a lot of his campaigning, you mightn't get a full sense of your lack of popularity. Now, he went to that pub in Newcastle where the pensioner got stuck into him, which turned out was more of a typical response in the electorate than his supporters. He won't be missed as Prime Minister, by the way. I note when he stepped down in his, uh, and he said, I won't be standing. Usually, even um, Kevin Rudd, for example, when he stepped down, there were cries of no, no, no. And Bill Shorten, when he stepped down, even though he'd had two goes and it, it was time for him to move on, whether rightly or wrong, wrongly, but it was. There were cries from the crowd of no, no, no. When Scott Morrison said it, it was just dead silence, which must have hurt him without even a few faithful saying, no, no, stay on, even if they didn't mean it. Nobody felt he should have stayed on at the after party of the the faithful who were so loyal, and this isn't a criticism of them, so loyal that they stayed till the bitter end to support the party. They knew it was time for him to go, that he had played a very weak hand very badly and lost very badly. Well, when Scott Morrison did announce that he was stepping down as the leader of the Liberal Party, there was quite a different response at the Labor headquarters. I, as leader, take responsibility for the wins and the losses. That is the burden and that is the responsibility of leadership. And as a result, I will be handing over the leadership at the next party room meeting to ensure that the party can be taken forward under new leadership, which is the appropriate thing to do. I have had the great privilege to lead this great party and to lead this great nation. And we mentioned this in our last episode, but there's always going to be election surprises and we never know where they're going to happen. That's why they're election surprises. And you referred to the Greens picking up some unexpected seats off Labor. They also picked up a seat off the Liberal Party in Queensland. Many of the Teal independents won their seat. That was a little bit of a surprise. We expected that some of them would win, but most of the candidates supported by Climate 200 won their seats, including David Pocock in the Senate. There were other parties who didn't do so well at all, and I found that a little bit surprising. The New Liberals, they were forced to campaign under the name of TNL, and not many people who looked at the ballot paper would have known which party that was, so that was a failure in political marketing. There was also a surprise for the Labor Party. Christina Keneally ran in the seat of Fowler in Western Sydney, and she was defeated by the independent Day Lee. And she had a swing of 16% towards her. So Labor learned a political lesson the hard way. Don't parachute candidates into safe seats that don't have anything to do with the local community. Although they did parachute Andrew Charlton into the seat of Parramatta and he actually had a swing towards him. So perhaps there were many other issues going on in the seat of Fowler. Fowler had put up to Lee and Sussex Street had said, no, no, Christina Keneally. Now, Keneally had been given an unwinnable Senate position, which is totally bizarre. Why you would give an ex-state party leader who had performed well in the Senate and was ranked fourth in Cabinet an unwinnable position is beyond me. And I will be fair, Keneally had been a pretty decent Senate performer too, particularly in terms of refugees and some finance things and, and her shadow ministry. She had not been a popular premier. It's not as if they had parachuted Bob Carr in to the job, who had been an immensely popular premier. I think being blonde, Anglo and American probably didn't help in the seat of Cabramatta. How much of that is not really for me to say, but the optics, as they say, didn't look right. And it was Daly, the uh, successful candidate, had run for the Liberal Party. I don't know if she didn't make pre-selection this time or if she didn't go for it, but wasn't the Liberal Party candidate. And she has distanced herself from the Teal independence. But she was known as a Liberal and got a 14% swing towards her. So that was a quite remarkable electoral thing too. But she was a part of the community, which Christina Keneally wasn't. I'm sure that there's a lot of people in 
Sussex Street now trying to hold on to their jobs who thought this was a good idea. And on every election night, there are victory speeches and concession speeches. I'm not too sure if Scott Morrison got the message that the Liberal Party was given on election night, but concession speeches do have to create a place in history for a departing Prime Minister and give hope for their political party in the future. It's a difficult night for Liberals and Nationals around the country, as nights like this always are. They are humbling, but so is victory. Victory is also humbling and always should be. Tonight, I've spoken to the Leader of the Opposition and the incoming Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and I've congratulated him on his election victory this evening. In this country, at a time like this, when we look around the world, and particular when we see those in the Ukraine fighting for their very freedom and liberty, I think on a light night like tonight, we can reflect on the greatness of our democracy. This has been a time of great upheaval over these past few years, and it has imposed a heavy price on our country and on all Australians. And I think all Australians have felt that deeply. And we've seen in our own politics a great deal of disruption as the way people have voted today with major parties having one of the lowest primary rights that we've ever seen. That says a lot, I think, about the upheaval that is taking place in our nation. And I think it is important for our nation to heal and to move forward. But at the same time, three years ago I stood before you and I said I believed in miracles. <laughs> I still believe in miracles. <laughs> I still believe in miracles as I always have. There's another great miracle which I want to give thanks for tonight, and that is the miracle of the Australian people. What Australians have endured over these past few years has shown a tremendous depth of character and resilience and strength. And each and every day, I've had the great privilege to lead this nation over the last more than three and a half years. And the one thing I have always counted on has been the strength and resilience and character of the Australian people. It has been the Australian people under the strong support of a strong government that has enabled all of us to come through to where we are today. And I think that's something that all Australians can give thanks for as we move forward. We hand over this country as a government in a stronger position than we left it, than we inherited it when we came to government those years ago under Tony Abbott. We leave government having secured our borders many years ago, and we leave government having restored our nation's defences. I've always believed that the purpose of a strong economy is not an end in itself, but to ensure a stronger nation that can provide the services that its people depend upon. But, but tonight, it's a night of disappointment for the Liberals and Nationals, but it's an also a time for coalition members and supporters all across the country to hold their heads high. We have been a strong government. We have been a good government. Australia is stronger as a result of our efforts over these last three terms. And over the next three years, I have no doubt, under strong leadership of our coalition, three years from now, I'm looking forward to the return of a coalition government. Thanks, everyone. Victory speeches have to be quite different for the winning side, and I think Albanese's speech was quite well thought out and considered. It touched on all the key points of the Labor Party in office and what they hope to achieve in government and pushed that poignant message of no one being left behind. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and on behalf of the Australian Labor Party, I commit to the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. And I say to my fellow Australians, thank you for this extraordinary honour. Tonight, the Australian people have voted for change. I am humbled by this victory, and I'm honoured to be given the opportunity to serve as the 31st Prime Minister of Australia.
My Labor team will work every day to bring Australians together, and I will lead a government worthy of the people of Australia. A government as courageous and hardworking and caring as the Australian people are themselves. My fellow Australians, it says a lot about our great country that the son of a single mum who was a disability pensioner, who grew up in public housing down the road in Camperdown, can stand before you tonight as Australia's Prime Minister. Every parent wants more for the next generation than they had. My mother dreamt of a better life for me, and I hope that my journey in life inspires Australians to reach for the stars. I want Australia to continue to be a country that no matter where you live, who you worship, who you love, or what your last name is, that places no restrictions on your journey in life. And I hope there are families in public housing watching this tonight. Because I want every parent to be able to tell their child, no matter where you live or where you come from, in Australia, the doors of opportunity are open to us all. And like every other Labor government, we'll just widen that door a bit more. Friends, we have made history tonight. And tomorrow, together, we begin the work of building a better future. A better future for all Australians. Thank you very much. As you'd expect, Albanese's speech had enthusiasm as the winner and Scott Morrison had the get-me-out-of-here feel to it. Scott Morrison's speech was really bizarre, I thought. When he accepted responsibility, it was almost as if it was a passing sentence designed to connect two paragraphs rather than have any substantial weight of it because he then spent the next day or so while people were still listening, trying to blame everyone, including the Labor Party, for his loss. <laughs> uh, well, blaming the Labor Party in this sense is actually correct. Isn't that their job? It'd be like, oh, a stupid policeman. I was doing 160 up the M4 and a stupid policeman pointed his speed camera at me. I'd have got away with it if he hadn't done that. You know, it's really bizarre. He was obviously trying to keep it upbeat. I think that he was trying to avoid the public humiliation of showing any negative emotion at all. I know that there were a lot on the left who wanted him to cry, and he didn't till the next day. So I suspect there was that bulldozer part of him that was not going to show any negative emotion. I remember things like my father, who tended to vote more towards the Liberal Party, when Kim Beasley gave his concession speech, I remember Dad saying if he'd spoken like that through the campaign, he'd have won. And a great concession speech can often redeem a failed tilt at the Prime Ministership. And the great marketer, the great campaigner, didn't understand this, I don't think. Instead, we got this rambling, over-positive, tinnied, blind speech of nothing, which, of course, probably summed up his Prime Ministership completely and his political career. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. We dance like New Year's Eve, we, we dance from sheer relief, whoa, everything must change. Just promise me this.
We've been critics of the mainstream media during this election campaign, and we are not going to stop now. But the election night coverage was almost as abysmal as the campaign coverage itself. Most of the coverage from all the mainstream channels, it was funereal once they got an understanding that the coalition was the big loser, and they kept on trying to spin this as a bad result for Labor. It's not often that we have a major political party winning the election or close to winning the election, and all the negatives start coming out. Here's Lee Sales asking Tanya Plibersek what went wrong for Labor. Let me bring in Tanya Plibersek here. Because, a very messy one. Well, let me bring in Tanya because um, when you look at the coalition's result, that should be a you know landslide basically for Labor, but it's not because there's so many others in Greens. So I guess the question for you is, what has Labor done wrong that it hasn't been a landslide for you? Uh, I don't... I don't know that you can draw conclusions about what we've done wrong when we are obviously the party that is most likely to be able to form government. Yeah, but it's not decisive. And a win is a win is a win. And <laughs> that is true. On 31.7% yeah. hey, of every state I mean, except for but, WA. But, but but less, but, less than a third no, of Australians have voted for you. Particularly mm. in this environment where around the world people are worried about change. They've, we've been through the pandemic. There's you know economic insecurity. Uh, it, I think... I'm focused on what we've done right because that's looking very good to me. Other journalists focused on this being an undeserving win for Labor. They ran a very poor campaign. They were the least worst and they had a modest agenda. And this is all coming from the ABC. But there were others that were far worse. Now we are faced with three years of hardcore left-wing government that will destroy the fabric of this nation. We will see our living standards crushed, our livelihoods damaged, our cultural institutions devastated, our kids' future prosperity decimated because, despite every warning we gave you, Scott Morrison and the bedwetters betrayed their conservative base. And then they all lost their seats. Talk about instant karma. But there is a silver lining to this cloud. Check my diary. Early 2025, put it in your diary too. Donald Trump will be sworn in as the next US president. And a few weeks later, Peter Dutton and the Liberals will be swept into power in Australia following three disastrous and incompetent years of a Teals-led Labor government where Parliament obsesses over woke identity politics, climate and Indigenous issues as the economy grinds to a halt under their watch. It's going to be a long three years. And that was one of Rowan Dean's better performances. If we had a professional media, the talk would be all about a fascinating election result and remapping of Australia's political landscape. This election result offers some pretty exciting possibilities for politics over the next five to ten years, but all the media could do was mope about their favoured team losing and how undeserving Labor's victory was. There's certainly, as we've mentioned already, things that the Labor Party could be looking at. When do you parachute a candidate into a seat? How do you work out who gets a winning Senate ticket? And I know that there are factional deals in there, but do you put number four in the cabinet at number three or four on the Senate, or do you value their contribution, if indeed it's been valuable? Simon Birmingham, I think his smallest bit of joy, and I'll be fair here, he did a pretty decent job on the ABC in terms of his analysis. He seemed to be willing to, to listen mm-hmm. and to really work out what had gone wrong. I suspect he already knew being one of the actual moderates rather than the whole strain of moderates who came in as soon as the election was called. So I think he already knew. But it gave him an excuse to articulate. And not everything he said was sensible. And I'm going to be fair to and allow for the fact that he was very sad and upset and a lot of his friends and colleagues who he liked had lost seats and what have you. So there was there was that. But he seemed quite prepared to think you know, how did we lose Kuyong? How did we lose North Sydney? How did we lose? We have to think about that. I think, too, that we are seeing, and I've been saying this for ages, too, we're seeing that the rise of social media, quite a few people pointed out that Twitter gave a more accurate view, not only of what was happening, but of what people were thinking. Now, Twitter, and I'm guilty of this too, has always been seen as a bit of an echo chamber without any real value to the public discourse. But I think if you go to places like Twitter and Reddit, where the real political debate was happening, there wasn't a lot of talk about the mainstream media, except for when 
senior journalists like, say, Laura Tingle or Paul Bongiorno or Malcolm Farr did good articles or good interviews and they were discussed properly. I'm going to step aside the whole Lee Sales thing because she seems to divide people. I think she does okay, but other people can't stand her, and that's fine. I don't watch a lot of 7.30 reports, so I, I can't really comment, and I only see sort of the, the good stuff that comes out. And, yeah, the ABC came in for a, a lot of criticism, pointing to the right-wing Ida Buttros, even though, and let's let's be fair here, Ida Buttros copped a lot of criticism from Sky, from News Corp, from Nine, from Channel 7 for her not bowing to uh, the whims of what they thought should have been broadcast. I don't think it's it's quite as simple as all of the mainstream media was terrible, but I noticed that the dumber parts or the, the less experienced parts or the less effective parts failed. The gotcha question, the first one didn't work and they kept trying again and again and again and again, even after Adam Bant smacked them down. In the end, Albanese walks out. And they tried to present him as petulant and not being up to pressure. But in all honesty, I think 52% or 51% of the Australian populace corrected for preferences agreed with him that this wasn't professional question asking. This was just petulant temper tantrum throwing. And I wouldn't deal with them either. Well, I realise that it's a little bit more complex than the way that I'm putting it, but I'm not expecting the media or the ABC to just be cheerleaders for the Labor Party, but I've found all of this just a little bit too bizarre. The media in general just seems to be incurious about politics, and this is one of the most amazing election results in Australia's history, but you'd think that these political commentators would be looking at all the possibilities that would be coming out of a large crossbench in Parliament and what the chill independence mean for the body politic and what national affairs will look like into the future. But generally, they were more keen to focus on all the negatives for Labor. And despite all of the best efforts by the media, the Labor Party did win the election. Maybe they didn't receive the memo about this, but right from day one of the campaign, when Albanese had those stumbles on the official cash rate, they declared that the election was pretty much already lost for the Labor Party. John Howard did have a lot of stumbles in the 1996 campaign. He also had quite a few stumbles in this campaign too, promoting the Mm. Liberal Party on the hustings. But in 1996, the electorate hated Paul Keating and in 2022 the electorate hated Scott Morrison and for some reason the media didn't study up on their political history and just on another point as well the ABC outside broadcast teams they were at the Labor function at the seat of Reid that's my local seat and this was a pretty spectacular result with Sally Situ defeating Fiona Martin, yet the ABC decided not to broadcast Sally Situ at all, even though they had their facilities there. They also had an outside broadcast team at the seat of Higgins within the Labor Party headquarters there, and that's a Liberal Party held seat and also the seat previously held by former Treasurer Peter Costello and that's quite a dramatic result and again the ABC decided not to broadcast from that seat and that was a seat won by Michelle Ananda Raja. Now I don't like bringing up these sporting analogies in politics but this is a little bit like a grand final result and most of the media then broadcast the results from the perspective of the losing team you know bad news the eastern suburbs have just lost the grand final or Collingwood have lost the grand final or insert your own team, Melbourne Vixens, Sydney FC or whoever, focusing on the losing team and then telling everyone what went wrong for the winning team, even though they've just won a grand final by 10 goals. So I do think that the Saturday night broadcast pretty much across the board was just a little bit strange. It was odd. And my point on Simon Birmingham before was that he was very quick to say that this is Labor's lowest primary vote since uh, 1919. It did have a bit of a flurry on social media that, oh, they don't have legitimacy because only a third of people voted for them. It doesn't matter. It's not how many people vote for you. It's how many seats you've won. And both parties have benefited from that in the past. It is odd. We saw pictures of Jenny Morrison moving out of Kirribilli. I don't know that anybody needed to be subjected to that. When I say that, I I don't think it's terribly newsworthy to see the Prime Minister's wife move out of a home. I don't think it's that newsworthy to see them move into their home either, but that's a different strategy used by the parties. The Liberal Party isn't listening to the lessons anyway, so there's not a lot of 
point in interviewing them till they've till they've had their internal reviews and that they can start to present new policies and new types of candidates and a strategy. The historical precedent I really see, and I think I said this before, is 1943, where the United Australia Party had lost all its credibility. They'd lost the majority in the House of Representatives, forcing brilliant campaigner, brash, arrogant bulldozer Robert Menzies to stand down as Prime Minister to be replaced by John Curtin. And the United Australia Party puts in 70-year-old Billy Hughes as his replacement, who had been Prime Minister in World War I and just after, but was not liked by the electorate. To get back to today, I see a lot of parallels with 1943, except Morrison won't be back. Word on the street is that the party loathe him and they were just looking, they were waiting for this. And the other word on the street, which I find highly unlikely, um, is that he will stand down uh, from the seat of Cook and it will go to by-election. That's not so unlikely. That's common with a lot of prime ministers and leaders of the party, but that they will try and parachute Josh Frydenberg in, which I suspect is very unlikely because he's the man who lost Kuyong, the heart of the Liberal Party, Menzies' seat, Latham's seat, Peacock's seat. And apart from a brief period for about 18 months in 1921-22, had been solidly non-Labour. Well, I guess these are the things that the media and generally the commentary should be looking at, legitimising the loss or the losses of the Liberal Party. But there's been a lot of acting out on the Conservative forces about delegitimising Labor's victory. And the the big narrative, you mentioned this before, the big narrative on election night was Labor's primary vote only being 30.6%. And since that time, it's snuck up to 32.8%. The coalition's vote isn't that much higher. It's around 36%. But this narrative, of course, it ignores how the preferencing system works in federal politics. And also, they can whinge about it for as long as they want, but it's not going to change the election result. But overall, there is this strange narrative going on. He's only been Prime Minister for less than a week, but News Corporation has already published a story claiming Anthony Albanese won't be the Prime Minister at the next election. How do they know? (laughs) (laughs) It's a very good question. They're they're also having a go at the electorate for making the wrong decision on Saturday night, and they're starting to talk about all the problems Labor is going to have at the 2025 election. So that's three years away. I'm not sure what they're talking about at this stage. Now, I I realise that old habits take a while to change, but they'll have to change their tune and they'll have to change their habits pretty soon because they can't really afford not to. Yeah, the trouble is, is that nobody thought Scott Morrison would make it to the next election. Now he did, and he did partly because he changed the rules, but also partly because he held on. Anthony Albanese is in a different position. He's built a very capable team, and this is where Bill Shorten should get some credit. He built the team. He's a little bit like Simon Crean, in that when Simon Crean was Labor leader, he actually did a lot to reform Labor and make it electorally credible for Kevin Rudd to win, that it devolves a few years later had nothing to do with either Kevin Rudd or um, Julia Gillard or Simon Cream for that matter. But Bill Shorten made Labor an electorally credible choice. He needs to be acknowledged for that. Anthony Albanese has kept that team together. I think the ministry is pretty identical to what Shorten presented with maybe a few changes, a few new faces, etc. But the prominent people, Mark Dreyfus as Attorney General, Penny Wong as Foreign Affairs, were part of Shorten's team, presented well then and are presenting well now. I'm going to miss someone if I try and list them all, so I'm not going to list them all. I'm just giving examples. They're trying the, the whole Trumpist. They tried to say the election was robbed for about five minutes but then that it showed how badly they actually did do based on the figures they were doing. And the Australian Electoral Commission, despite the kicking it's received in the last nine years from the the government in terms of staff cuts, funding cuts, undermining of its credibility through the, the newspaper, did a very good job in running a fair election and an open election and a transparent election. And the AEC needs to be congratulated for doing that under very difficult circumstances. Hopefully things will settle down and Labor will move it back to where it should be, totally independent, free, fair and efficient. It hasn't been terribly efficient through no fault of its own in, over the last few years. But hopefully it'll move back to being that. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts 
Listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music. Or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. Brings forth the heavy day. Brings forth the nighttime swell. There's also the wash-up after the election result and Anthony Albanese was sworn in as Prime Minister on the Monday after the election along with four other cabinet ministers and we haven't had this sort of cabinet since the Whitlam Barnard cabinet after the 1972 election so this is just an interim cabinet and was prepared so Albanese could attend the Quad Security Dialogue meeting in Japan. Now, you can't mess around after an election result. Albanese has hit the ground running, meeting up with Joe Biden, Narendra Modi and Kishido Fumio. And this enabled him to promote his agenda on the international stage. He seemed to be well received at the Quad meeting. And for all of those commentators saying nobody knows who Anthony Albanese is, well, they'll be finding out a lot more about him over the next three years. And as we know, there can only be one party that forms government after an election, so it And so it is with the Labor Party. But the coalition has got many problems on its hands. And while it's only a week since the election, they might not have learned the lesson from their loss last Saturday night. There is talk of Peter Dutton becoming the leader of the Liberal Party, which means that he'll be the leader of the opposition. But this is almost like a continuation of the Howard government. We're not sure why the party would go back to the future for their next leader. But if he's the only one putting up his hand, well, he ends up becoming the leader. Should the Do you think that the Liberal Party should be encouraging other Liberal Party MPs to run for the leadership or should they stick with Peter Dutton? Liberal Party suggesting that Peter Dutton become the next leader probably had most progressives punching the air because it means that they will win the next election if he's still there then. Now, of course, whenever there's a crushing electoral defeat like this, the leader who gets elected first rarely goes to the next election. And if they do, they rarely win it. Because if they're doing their job properly, they're rebuilding the party. I think Peter Dutton, the failed minister, the man who is loathed within the party, maybe not now, now a lot of his colleagues are gone, maybe he's not quite as loathed as he was, the man who is loathed outside of his own electorate at Dixon. I don't think that they really think he's going to win an election, but it might shut him up. Here's the leadership you've been hungering for. Have it till we find someone better. We find someone who might win an election. That might be the case. A man who's was probably more unpopular with women than Scott Morrison and Tony Abbott, for that matter. A man whose corporate memory includes making fun of the island nations for sinking and all the while denying a crisis climate. A man whose tin ear has less subtlety than Scott Morrison's tin ear, which means all the subtlety of a sledgehammer applied to concrete. To be honest, if I was in the party, I don't know what I'd do either. They've had a very terrible, shocking loss to a lot of them. They thought that the strategies of 2019 would win again. But as we pointed out, they were ignoring their key seats. So even if they won Parramatta and Warringah and some of the the more marginal seats they were targeting, and it looks like they've won Gilmore in New South Wales, for example, they'd lost so much of the core base that they wouldn't be able to form government. And I don't know that Peter Dutton is the person to be able to take you through this type of reform that's needed. They really need another Brendan Nelson. And I don't know that there's anyone in the party, perhaps Simon Birmingham, but he's in the Senate. So he's disqualified. And I doubt he's willing to move to the lower house at the moment. I think that would be a big risk. And a by-election might get rid of some of the residual dislike of the party as the ALP starts to do good and positive things. 
Well, people can change, and Peter Dutton might be able to change as well, but essentially you can only choose from the pool of people that are actually in Parliament, and there might not be enough MPs of talent within the Liberal Party at the moment. We talked about some of those options a few episodes ago. Dan Tehan, Michael Tudge, Melissa Price, Angus Taylor, Josh Frydenberg has gone. Peter Dutton isn't a brilliant candidate, but one former Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, he's going to be sitting on the backbench, and it's not clear why he's still there. Most Prime Ministers, after they lose an election, generally retire from politics so you never know there might be some kind of comeback for Scott Morrison in the future the other consideration is that since 1931 every government has been in office for at least two terms and that's not to say that that's exactly what will happen with this Labor government but the chances are that there's at least six years of opposition for whoever the leader of the Liberal Party is and that's likely to be Peter Dutton but there is now that buffer created by a large crossbench and that will make it difficult for the coalition to return to office at the 2025 election and this election result is also following a worldwide trend since the pandemic commenced. Electorates are tending to go back to centre-left governments and the Liberal Party choosing a leader from the hard right. And for all of his time as Health Minister, Immigration Minister and Home Affairs Minister, Peter Dutton has pushed that idea of being the tough guy, the, the mean guy and quite a nasty one as well. Politics is all about differentiating yourself from your political opponents, but Dutton might not be the right choice for the Liberal Party at this point of time in our history. This is not what the public want. The first thing Anthony Albanese did was put the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island flags back. There was only one of each flag, and it was done properly. There's an order of precedence which runs from left to right. The National Australian flag, which should represent national unity and solidarity, was on the left, and then the Aboriginal flag was in the middle, and then the Torres Strait Islander flag was on, on the right. The next thing they're doing is releasing the Moorugupan family and back to Biloela, and hopefully they will get a just and fair and large compensation for that. And I know that the people in Biloela have already started preparing for their return. So we're already starting to see the government bringing compassion and empathy back in. In fact, the first announcement was the Uluru Statement from the Heart would be activated, which is a great thing. Now, I note that they're doing all this stuff at the beginning of their term because some of this stuff doesn't translate into votes, but it's important. And for a lot of the people who had waited nine years and had seen three disappointing elections, on the fourth election, it shows to me at least, that that the Labor Party is listening to the electorate and starting to move towards what the electorate is after. These are also strong sign points for what the Labor government wants to do. So the flags at the first media conference that Albanese held, that's a significant issue. And you sort of think, well, this is quite a simple thing to do. Why wasn't it done before? The Murugupan family being sent back to Biloela. Why didn't that happen before? Mm. Albanese has also mentioned that arrangements are also in place for the development of an anti-corruption commission. He's promised that by the end of this year. The leader of government business, Tony Burke, he suggested that he wants to clean up parliament, removing Dorothy Dix's, and they're those useless questions the government asks of its own side of politics, and good riddance to bad rubbish. Those Dorothy Dixit questions are a complete waste of time. And I realise that it's only week one of her new government, but it's also been a softer week this week. There's no bluff and blustering. We're not hearing the loudmouth Morrison with his grandstanding and constant lies. And all of these changes are very, very simple. Yet Morrison and through nine years of the Liberal government, they didn't do any of these things. So these are just the smaller issues and the big issues do remain. The economy is going to be a big factor over the next three to five years and the new Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, he's already signalling the tough times ahead. Yeah, the challenges in the economy are pretty clear. You know, we've got high and rising inflation and therefore rising interest rates. Uh, We've got real wages falling backwards quite substantially. And we've got a trillion dollars of debt in the budget, which will take generations to pay off, but is not currently going to deliver a generational dividend. And so the the challenges that I'm inheriting from my predecessor are pretty serious challenges. Uh, We want to be upfront about that. We've already begun the work uh, of trying to address particularly those three challenges that I mentioned. Now, Jim Chalmers does have to play the politics of this quite forcefully. Every incoming government will say that the financial books are far more severe than anticipated, but managing expectations is one major issue for the Labor government over the next three years. It's becoming clear that the pattern is, (laughs) and this has been true since at least 1929, that 
incoming Labor governments have to fix the economy. This was one of Jim Scullin's problems in 1929. He couldn't fix the economy. He was given a hospital pass of the World Depression and then a split party. The party split over it. 1943, Curtin inherits a wartime treasury that isn't quite as efficient as everyone was hoping. 1972, Whitlam inherits a tired economy that was in some kind of decline. 1983, Hawke inherits a global recession. There's a pattern of three or four global recessions. But by 1996, Keating handed over to the Howard government a good economy. And then in 2007, Kevin Rudd got the double whammy of an economy that wasn't as in good shape as it might have been, coupled with a global financial crisis that had been pretty much unprecedented since at least the 1930s and probably the 1890s. So it is one of the things that Labor has to, or an opposition has to prepare itself for, that things aren't as good as the government's saying, and nobody believes the unemployment rate, and not many people believe the inflation rate. So that may put a hole in some of the things that Labor wants to do. Having said that, Katie Gallagher as finance minister bodes well at this point, and Jim Chalmers as treasurer bodes well at this point. Things can change. Good people go bad. Good people don't seem to be as good as they are. Things are worse, and things can get out of control. We'll be here to watch it. I've been saying that as independent journalists, and this is to everyone out there doing independent journalism, our work's really just beginning because we're not being distracted by endless buffoonery. We can actually look at policy. We can actually look at what's going on and we can actually help inform the populace of how well or how poorly things are going. And no government is perfect. Some things are going to go poorly, sometimes through incompetence, sometimes through inexperience and sometimes because things just spin out of anyone's control and we'll be there to watch it that's it for this episode of new politics thanks for listening in if you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au we don't beg plead beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in, and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.